you, you see the warnings from the vanguards of the world. The early stage tech, especially this very disturbing trend of really falling for gimmicks, right? What, what happened to VR? What happened to Web3? You know, crypto has sort of, you know, been up and down. The creator economy came and went. NFTs are a joke. You, you can't run an investment fund just based on narrative. You've got to run it based on results and returns. How would a Fed pivot and a new president impact uh, the tech sector? Well, we'll talk about these themes with our next guest who's had uh, experiences working in both the tech sector and politics. He's Bradley Tusk, founder and CEO of the VC fund Tusk Ventures. Tusk Ventures has invested in over 30 startups, including Ripple, Coinbase, Lemonade. He's a founder of Tusk Strategies as well, a political and policy advisory firm, which has worked with Walmart, Google, Pepsi, AT&T, among many other big firms. He was former VP of Lehman Brothers, former campaign manager for Michael Bloomberg when he was running for mayor of New York, former deputy governor of Illinois, and the author of the upcoming book, Vote With Your Phone, Why Mobile Voting is Our Final Shot at Saving Democracy. That's a very interesting title, Bradley. Can't wait to talk to you about that. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Let's start by talking about the Fed first and market. Sure. We talk about your book and uh, yeah. how we could save democracy with our phone. Um, very interesting subject matter. So expected 25 basis point cut is what's priced yep. in as of Wednesday, September 11th. I've talked to analysts who went as far as to say that 50 basis point is on the table. But anyway, it's expected that the Fed will pivot next week. How is this going to impact the tech sector? Uh, I should only help. Now, keep in mind, when we say the tech sector, there's really two worlds. There's there's public equities, and then there's the whole venture world, which I'm part of, which are privately held companies. Um, certainly on the privately held side, there has been a real liquidity crunch now for the last couple of years. Uh, very few successful tech IPOs, uh, very little M&A, and I think the entire venture world has been looking for something to kind of break things loose, and a rate cut uh, has very much been on the agenda because um, when fixed they come is so attractive, then people sort of have less need to risk money uh, on the venture side. And so I I do think a rate cut will be really helpful. I am hopeful, especially with the inflation news uh, that came out today, that it's more like half a basis point and and not a quarter. Um, But I think that's one of the things that can really move things uh, ahead. And then, you know, for for the bigger tech sector, obviously also just, you know, capital that is less expensive is going to allow them to continue to make uh, more and more investments. And given that the cost of compute these days for AI is so high. I think everyone needs access to lower cost capital in order to make those infrastructure investments. Let's talk about the public sector, uh, public equities first. Sure. Before we yeah. talk about the VC side, so uh, frothiness in the and uh, tech stocks, the big seven. Um, are you seeing any of that? Are you seeing frothiness, overvaluation, investors I mean, taking profits n- off the table? You know, Nvidia, I think, might be an example of that. It's yeah. it's a really fascinating company, right? Because on one hand, it's not pie in the sky. I mean, their revenue is astronomical, right? I think the last quarter was thirty billion dollars in revenue. So it's it's not like we're just betting on some. We have some giant P ratio where we're just sort of betting on the promise of something. But what's interesting is all of their customers are betting on the promise of something, right? So AI, you know, may be the most transformational technology ever built. You know, there's a million different ways that we can talk about it, uh, but it doesn't generate a lot of revenue right now. So yes, the companies providing the infrastructure to build out AI like NVIDIA, yes, they are generating revenue. And so it makes sense. But ultimately, um, you are still betting on the demand for their chips and, uh, you know, for infrastructure to continue to be high. And what we haven't really seen yet is a lot of consumer dollars coming back on, on the other side. So like chat GPT is, is a really useful tool. And I think people are finding different applications for it that are helpful. No one's spending tremendous amounts of money just yet uh, on on the ability to access generative AI. And so um, it is frothy in the sense that you have to truly believe that sooner rather than later, um, consumer spend on AI products is going to be really meaningful. Otherwise, eventually demand from Meta, from Apple, from Amazon, from everyone else um, for products like NVIDIA's is is going to fall. Um, and the share price is so high that it assumes that that debt demand is going to be indefinite. And so, you know, you have to really believe that there's not just a potential for AI, but that it's going to start converting into real dollars and spend pretty soon. 
Before we continue with the interview, I want to tell you about another way you can invest your Bitcoins and store them safely instead of using a traditional wallet or an exchange. Consider an IRA. Today's sponsor, iTrust Capital, is one such IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1% only. And being an IRA, it also offers unique tax benefits. If you'd like to get started and learn more, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below or scan the QR code up here if you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account you can do so using my referral link and if you use that referral link you'll get a hundred dollars in signing bonuses how likely is one of nvidia's competitors going to catch up how significant is the moat they build around their products? Um, look, I, I think specifically, you know, for the GPUs that they make, um, they have built one. But I think what we don't know is, you know, what direction AI is going to take, right? And so ultimately, you know, their competitors are producing typically slightly different types of chips. So if what everyone needs is what NVIDIA is making, which is sort of the current assumption, um, then NVIDIA is way out ahead. Um, but ultimately, it's going to partly be determined like like everything by the markets, right? And the markets are determined by what consumers want, what businesses want, uh, and that those preferences are really what and dictate how money is spent and how money is spent dictates, you know, where the market goes and where companies go. And so, you know, if NVIDIA is confident that all of the areas for real um, revenue generation within AI um, come from companies using their specific types of chips, I think they're in good shape. Um, but, you know, again, you're making a big bet uh, and in a, in a ball game, just just to use sort of a baseball analogy, we're still on the, the top of the first inning, and you know what we don't know about AI vastly dwarfs what we do know, and so everyone who is sort of choosing to invest at the top of market with Nvidia should know, you know, you are making a bet. I want to talk about concentration risk, which is the uh, risk that the market overall is driven by just a few stocks and videos yeah. included. I'm going to flip over to my screen now, uh, Bradley. So this is a chart of the Nasdaq Composite over the last one year. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you an overlay uh, with the Russell 2000. There have been certain periods over the last one year and beyond when they've completely diverged. Case in point earlier this year when the Russell trailed down and the stock markets for the for the Nasdaq continued to go up, partly mm -hmm. driven by ex, uh, earnings beats by the MAG-7. Um, are you seeing, are we seeing going to, or are, is this going to end basically this divergence? Is the Nasdaq expected to, in your opinion, tr start trading in line with the rest of the broad equities markets, you think? I, I, I hope so, because I, th I think it's very risky to be so dependent uh, on seven companies. And look, some of those companies are amazingly profitable and successful right now, like Apple, like Google. Um, but at the same time, those companies do face different headwinds, whether it's, you know, competition in products and technology or, or regulation and antitrust. And at the same time, a company like Tesla is still to a certain extent, you know, half reality, half pixie dust, right? You know, everyone is sort of betting that Elon will figure something out that no one else can. And he very well might. I mean, he's not someone you want to underestimate. But at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of Tesla's market cap is not driven by rational economic decision making. It's different. It's, it's driven by, you know, tweets and, you know, finance bros and day traders and, and Elon fanboys. Um, and to me, that's not a great basis uh, to make investment decisions. And so, you know, I don't think it's healthy to have so much reliance on just a handful of stocks. Um, but I also think that what we really need to see for the market to broaden out is a lot more IPOs, right? There's just been a total dearth of the IPO market. We certainly feel that very strongly, you know, on the venture side, we're just very few portfolio companies of any ones are, are going public. Um, the ones that have gone public have been cut so significantly uh, in terms of the valuations that, you know, there needs to be a lot more liquidity, a lot more IPOs, and that's going to require a combination of rate cuts, uh, regulatory changes. I think we'll get some of those uh, based on, on the outcome of, of the election. But also, I think part of the problem is is the venture community itself in that people got greedy. They raised funds that were way too big. They valued portfolio companies way too highly because they wanted to drive up their own returns on paper. And they wanted to justify really big funds that generate a lot of management fees. And by the time that, that privately held companies got to the public markets, they were wildly overvalued. And the markets were saying, you know what? You know, This company is not a $30 billion company. It's an $8 billion company. Um, and, and cutting the share price by 50 to 70%. And, you know, I, I can't disagree with that, right? So hopefully one good outcome 
of the real challenges that that the private tech market has faced over the last couple of years is people realizing that um, absolute greed in valuations really hurts them long term. And we are seeing companies with valuations that are a lot more realistic, um, which is just a much, at least a much healthier market. Uh, what types of tech companies, what types of products do you think will have the most investment potential in the coming a uh, couple years or so is it mostly on the software or hardware side you know it, generally software i mean we we are certainly not hardware investors um again we are early stage investors but the areas of course would be ai and specifically within ai it is for us data privacy data integrity uh, regulatory compliance, deep fake prevention, uh, professional licensure, things like that. Um, in the uh, electrification world, we think the combination of all the tax incentives created by the Inflation Reduction Act combined with all of the new building codes at the state and local level really moves uh, the market for things like electrification of heat pumps and products like that. Um, we think there are really big trend shifts in higher education uh, with it, that the um, public confidence in the value of a four-year liberal arts degree has really plummeted and the cost of it is so high that alternatives to that have become really attractive. So for example, we just led the uh, series A of a company that does the payment rails uh, for um, uh, vocational at schools, trade schools. And so we think that's another trend that's interesting. Uh, dual use defense technology. So, you know, old, initially most defense tech was, was products being done specifically for the needs of DOD. Um, we are now seeing that some of that same technology is also useful to state and local governments, to utilities, to consumers, to, to companies. Um, and so that's an interesting trend. So, so those are a few that, that we've been excited about. Let me do my screen one more time. I'm going to read you an article here from Business Insider. This is said, uh, this is saying U.S. stocks are overvalued because of unrealistic expectations for AI-powered economic growth. Vanguard says, I'll just read you the first couple paragraphs. With tech companies still pushing the boundaries of AI, market excitement for it seems endless, but this enthusiasm expects too much from the technology and too little time, Vanguard wrote in a note on Thursday. Um, so it goes on to basically say that uh, – Earnings expectations are basically overblown because too much hope has been put on AI. Do you agree with this? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of what I was saying before, which is, you know, there's got to be real revenue from consumers, right? Like right now, all of the revenue are bets from big companies in the AI space or getting into the AI space saying, hey, we have to have the infrastructure in order to make these products. But ultimately, people have to buy the products, right? And if if they don't, so like, let's take the new iPhone as an example. Um, I, I don't know how well it's going to sell because I, I would say that, you know, the the what was unveiled the other day was pretty underwhelming, right? None of the real physical hardware updates all seem all that exciting, a little bit on the camera side. Um, and then, yeah, there's this potential of the use of AI, but is it anything that right now I would pay personally a lot more money for? No. Um, you know, uh, it is, you know, I tend to use perplexity as, as the AI search engine that, that I happen to like, but is it consistently better than Google? A little. Um, is it worth a really big spend? The 20 bucks a month I pay or whatever is fine, but I, I wouldn't pay materially more than that. And so, so right now, the value proposition, I would say by and large, is not really there yet. Um, there are definitely some commercial applications like in mining, for example, AI is helping companies figure out like, oh, we can really, you know, reduce the spend and cost in in discovering, you know, new deposits or whatever it is. Sure. So there are some of that, but but overall it's a consumer driven economy and the products are not there yet. Well, maybe like like you pointed out, it's mostly commercial. Maybe it's B2B that's benefiting from AI. Yeah. I mean, I think where there is benefit right now, that's that's exactly where it is. Uh, but even there. You know, there are use cases for sure, but but by and large, you know, I am not seeing most of the sectors. So, for example, we're heavy investors in digital health and like is AI, it is useful in the drug formation business potentially to come up with new compounds like GLP-1s, but that hasn't really happened yet at scale. But most of the, the consumer businesses of telemedicine companies sort of servicing, you know, individual patients, you know, that's, it's electronic, it's internet, it's mobile, but has AI itself made a massive difference? No. Okay. So going back to the article here, it says Vanguard Global Chief Economist Joe Davis said that uh, corporate profits would have to grow by 40% annually over the next three years to justify where stocks are trading now from a valuations perspective. So let me just ask you this. Uh, what do tech companies need to do hypothetically to grow 40% annually in, in profits 
um, over the next couple of years besides AI? What else? Well, a few, one is I, I think you got to reduce the spend. So, so let me give you the corollary in, in my world, right, which is um, I invested seed in Series A. So I was I was looking at a company the other day in the AI space. They had revenue of $2 million, and they were expecting a term sheet at well over a north of $100 million valuation. And, you know, in any other sector, a company with $2 million in revenue, we're looking at like a 30 to 50 at most million dollar valuation. And I'm not doing those deals because ultimately my job is to return capital to my LPs. It's to be able to try to return the entire fund on every single deal. And I can't do that uh, when I'm paying way, way too much on the front end. And so whether it's in the private tech markets, people wildly paying overvalued prices uh, for AI investments or on the public side, people just buying up way too much infrastructure and capacity that doesn't really reflect the true demand for the product. First thing I would say is you got to cut your costs, right? So profit is comes from from two things. Yes, it comes from more sales, but it also comes from, from spending less. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, one of the places where, where tech especially gets into trouble is this notion of sort of just shoot from the hip or, you know, if you built it, they will come or, you know, whatever cliche you want to use here. But just because you have a cool idea or a good platform or a marketplace or whatever it is, it doesn't mean it's going to be a successful product in terms of being highly profitable. And so, um, Yes, uh, you know, you, we say outside of AI, yeah, you know, double down on products that currently are do have customer demand. But but beyond that, I think also, you know, don't fall captive to just trends and hype and overinvest in things, whether it's valuations or infrastructure, that ultimately just makes it impossible for you to have, you know, a decent profit margin or return real money to your LPs. Two years ago, let's turn let's turn now to the um the private side, the VC side. Two years ago, Y Combinator wrote a letter to founders warning of an economic downturn. I think the letter was called Economic Downturn. This is on my screen right now. I'm yep. not going to read the whole thing, but basically they were warning founders that the next couple of months may be bad for fundraising. Capital may dry up. Basically, half enough runway to last the next 24 months. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was the landscape for 2022, 2023, 2022. Saw a big sell off in equities, as you know. Is that still the case now? Yeah. It is. Uh, it, it is maybe just now starting to change. You know, as we began this conversation, uh, the rate cut might have a, an impact on that. But overall, you were seeing far fewer funding rounds, far less new company formation. Um, the time between rounds has lengthened significantly. So I raised my first fund in 2016, and we were seeing some of our portfolio companies every eight months go out and raise another round. Now that's more like 24 to 36 months. Uh, valuations are lower. Round sizes are lower. Um, AI has been something of an exception in that front. But overall, Y Combinator was very much right. And by the way, you know, this trend started more than two years ago. So if anything, they were a little late to the uh, realization. And um, of, will it turn? Yeah, it better. Or, or VC in this country is going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, but it's going to require some external changes like meaningful rate cuts, like new regulators and regulations, um, and like a slate of successful IPOs where the value does hold, you know, over a six to 12 month period at least. Has it been an environment where if a founder just slaps the words AI in anything, they get funding? It has been, but I think that's going to start to change because ultimately, you know, you, you see the warnings from the vanguards of the world. And at a certain point, uh, if people say, uh, you know, there's just I've got to be able to see the return here and not just sort of get a pat on the back because it looks like I'm cool and I'm ahead of the game because I'm investing in AI. Um, then, you know, that's what starts to to dampen enthusiasm. Look, tech has this early stage tech, especially this very disturbing trend of really falling for gimmicks, right? What, what happened to VR? What happened to web three? You know, crypto has sort of, you know, been up and down. The creator economy came and went. NFTs are a joke. Um, and so, uh, you know, oh, there's a lot of times where um, investors, in order to sort of try to differentiate themselves from others in the marketplace, claim that they're focused specifically on a, a particular sector or set. Um, but, but in and of itself, you know, you, you can't run an investment fund just based on narrative. You've got to run it based on results and returns. Um, and that means investing at reasonable valuations. Give us a few examples of the most successful startups that you've invested in, um, sure. how they've done things differently, what made them unicorns? 
Yeah, so uh, FanDuel was the first deal that we ever did. Um, and what made FanDuel a unicorn is they first sort of pioneered, along with DraftKings, the, the daily fantasy sports betting model that captured a, a lot of customers. A lot of people were really excited about that. And then when the Supreme Court overturned the federal prohibition on allowing states to do sports betting, uh, FanDuel and DraftKings became the two companies that were able to capitalize the most on it because they already had this great customer base from fantasy sports betting. Um, and ultimately, that led to a $11 billion exit for, for FanDuel. Um, but it was because they really identified this trend and then were able to sort of really cheat, gain market share quickly and get ahead of everyone else. Um Lemonade, uh, uh, property casualty insurer, and what they identified is if you could sell people insurance online really easily and quickly, make the claim process hassle-free, um, sell it at really reasonable rates, you can both pick up really high volume and also pick up a customer base uh, of much younger people who ne weren't necessarily getting things like renter's insurance um, because it was too much hassle or it was too much money. And they were able to identify a, a new segment in the marketplace. And then ultimately that turned them into um, a unicorn as well. Um, Roman, which is a men's health company. So Zach Raitano, the, the founder and CEO, had this insight that now seems so simple, but it was brilliant, which is uh, they said they started off by selling generic Viagra. And his view was if a guy has to go to the doctor and say, I want Viagra, a certain number will do it. If he can do it through his phone, more will do it, you know, over video. But if he can do it asynchronously over text and never have to interact with another human being and there's no embarrassment or humiliation, exponentially more will do it. And that's exactly what happened. And, and Zach basically invented prescription via text and then created a national pharmacy to be able to fulfill those orders. Um, and that turned Roman into a, a company, you know, worth billions of dollars. So, you know, that that's three, um, Alma, Wheel, Coinbase, Circle, Bird for a while. You know, we've been really lucky uh, to have a bunch of companies that have done pretty well. But I think in every case, it is someone identifying a potential change to consumer behavior that people will start spending money on a product that they hadn't before, or that a demographic of people that had been previously ignored by the marketplace um, should be taken seriously. And it's identifying those and then executing on it, right? So it's very easy to come up with good ideas. I get pitched good ideas by founders every single day. The number of those that, that turn into successful companies is pretty low. And then the number of those that turn into unicorns is even lower. Um, and so it's all about execution. You've seen that show, Silicon Valley. Uh, I have. Maybe. Yeah, okay. yeah, I course. can't remember which episode this was, but I have to bring this up. At one point, someone was talking about revenue and then there was a, there was a VC that started freaking out. No, we don't want revenue. Right, we want a pure play. We want no revenue. Okay, <laughs> let's talk. Okay, otherwise, otherwise valuations are going to become too low. We want like just uh, you know high in the sky potential. Correct. That's how we're going to raise money. <laughs> we have to address value uh, valuations and and financials for some of these startups. Right, these startups that you've mentioned that have done well, that have been successful. How do they manage their uh, their finances in the beginning that have propelled them to actually become successful? I mean, a few things. One is they focus on revenue, right? I mean, in a way, Silicon <laughs> Valley is to venture as Veep is to politics. And having worked in both of those fields, I can tell you they're scarily accurate, even though they're both meant to be satire and parody. Sure. Um, so one is these are companies that actually do focus on generating revenue. Two, they're be able to say, okay, here is a customer base that previously has not been identified or activated, and they're finding it and they're reaching them. And then ultimately, you know, they're not just acquiring growth and customers at all costs at the expense uh, of profitability. You know, they are able to lower their CAC. They're able to sort of have high lifetime value uh, for their customers. Um, and, and it's not just a question of this giant churn where, you know, the numbers look great, but you're spending even more money than you could possibly bring in from it. Um, and it's all kind of a Ponzi scheme. And so, you know, ultimately, unit economics matter. Profitability matters. Margin matters. And I think that, you know, the joke that the that the character in Silicon Valley was was sort of emphasizing was the idea of like, let's not worry about all of that. Let's just show that there's a lot of growth potential and then we can sort of charge whatever we want in terms of the valuation. Um ultimately that's that movie ends bad. Well, if a startup is generating real growth in terms of users, right? They're growing their user base uh, exponentially, but their cash flow negative. Would that concern you? That's okay. No, no. I mean, I have portfolio companies where, you know, I want to keep reinvesting in mm. new areas of growth, new product development, you know, expand the product roadmap. So no, absolutely not. But 
if none of it is leading to actual profitability. So if it's purely that you're taking VC money, spending it on marketing, acquiring a lot of customers, look like you're growing real fast, but there's no underlying product or revenue to actually support it, then that's meaningless. If you are a company that is meaningfully growing in revenue, but the reason that you choose not to pursue uh, profitability is because there's so much more revenue that you can generate by expanding into other products, and that takes R&D and innovation and building out the sales force and everything else. That's fine. That's what you want. Um, but again, something real has to be the underpinning of it. Are, are there consistent KPIs that you look at across different sectors that would indicate success down the line? Average. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, right. yeah. Well, it's first is, is is their product market fit, right? I mean, ultimately, there's all kinds of great ideas of what people could do or should do, and that doesn't mean that it's it's what it will do. Um, so that's one. Two is you know, I I think for a Series A company, I want to see you know mid seven figures in revenue. Um, and I don't like this notion of like, oh, we're just going to bet everything on the upside. So a company might only have, you know, $9 million in revenue, but let's make it a $200 million Series B company. That's ridiculous, right? You know, you, you shouldn't have, you know, ratios that are that high. Um, and then ultimately, you know, customer acquisition, you know, you, the CAC may be high initially, but you've got to be able to show that you can lower it and acquire customers uh, at a reasonable cost or otherwise it doesn't mean anything. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, because look, I, I have invested in and and have started and built businesses that are not venture backed as well, that are just pure bootstrapped. You know, you got to generate more cash than you spend if you want to make a profit. And the, the same principles of those at the end of the day have to apply to tech startups as well. What kinds of companies have been pitched to you over the last two years? Has there been a shift in trends? Yeah, I mean, everyone now puts the words AI on every pitch deck, whether or not there actually is any real meaningful AI component to it. So that's um, that's first and foremost. Um, I think climate has gone up simply because there's been so much federal money pumped into uh, incentives that that has made that sector um a lot more, uh, a lot more reliable. Um, you know, digital health uh, continues to grow. It's a sector that we've invested heavily in, are excited about. Um, so we see more and more of that. Um, ed tech has been making kind of a comeback in the last couple of years. Um, so that has been an area that has been sort of a pleasant surprise um, for us. You know, crypto kind of goes hot and cold. Um, there are times where people are super excited about it, times less so. Um, and then look, you know, part of it is trends and fads. So just a couple of years ago, when the same with everyone slaps the words AI on every deck now, everyone slapped the words Web Web three. I haven't seen the words Web three in two years now, right? Yeah. So you know, um, again, for us, because we are investing specifically when we believe that there's regulatory arbitrage and we can meaningfully improve a company's growth and valuation by solving regulatory problems and headaches and, and, and legalizing a product. You know, we don't really have to chase trends and fads. Uh, we're different because we're the only venture fund that I'm aware of that can go out there and pass legislation for you or block bad legislation or deal with unions or procurement or media or whatever it is. And so for me, you know, that that's what I'm looking for. Um, and I don't really care, you know, whether or not something is getting, you know, a lot of hype in, in tech media. Turning on to politics, starting with your book, uh, Vote With Your Phone While Mobile Voting is Our Final Shot. At saving democracy. Okay, well, that's um, lots to unpack at that title. Yeah. What's wrong, what's wrong with conventional voting at a at a booth? Uh, nobody does it. That's the problem. Um, so it, it it you may have a good experience with it. You may not. But fundamentally, um, turnout in primaries and primaries tend to be the elections that matter the most in the U.S. because of something called gerrymandering, where the districts are drawn to be a Republican district or a Democratic district. So it's almost preordained. So it's really whoever wins the primaries who's going to win the general election. Primary turnout in this country is typically 10 to 15 percent. And so fundamentally, there's nothing necessarily wrong with going to the voting booth if people go, but nobody goes. Right. So like I'm here in New York City. Eight and a half million people, greatest city in the world. Primary turnout last year was 7.2% for the city council. You could win a seat to the New York City Council with 7,000 votes. And so definitionally, A, nobody's participating. And B, it gets us, creates all the wrong incentives, right? So the who are that, who is that 7%, that 10%, it's the furthest left or the furthest right or special interests that can control money and votes and low turnout primaries. And as a result, our elected officials are held hostage by the extreme. 
dreams. Um, I have spent, you know, 30 years now in and around politics. And the thing that I have learned is every policy output is the result of a political input. Every politician makes every decision solely based on reelection and nothing else. Um, and all they want to do is get reelected. And if the only people who matter are that 10 percent who show up to vote in their primary and they're all super far left or super far right, then that's all you're going to do. And guess what you're not going to do? Work with the other side compromise, find consensus, get things done and solve problems. And so we have an era of total dysfunction because nobody bothers to vote. So low voter turnout is a function of the inconvenience of physically going to a booth? Yes. That's, I mean, people just saying? don't. Okay. It, it, yeah. And it, it may sound like it shouldn't be. But, you know, I would challenge the 194,000 subscribers you have to think about the last time you voted in a state Senate primary, a city council primary, a state rep primary, even a congressional primary. So, yes, there's a presidential election in eight weeks. That will have pretty good turnout. A lot of us, including a lot of the 194,000 people watching this, will show up for that. But that's one election every four years, and it's just one small piece of government. And the vast majority of your life really is dictated by what's happening at the municipal level and the state level, and people aren't turning out. And at the same time, think about what we do on our phones today. We do our banking on our phones. We do our love life on our phones. We do our health care on our phones. Um, and if you can securely vote on your phone, we got to meet people where we are and get turnout from, say, 10 percent up to 30, 40 percent, because that's what moves things to the middle and allows things to get done. OK, so let's talk about your vision for voting with our phones um, yes. before we talk about the uh, some of the more obvious security risks. Yeah, what- sure. What does it look like? What, what what does this plan look like here? Yeah. So it, it, we've already funded elections out of my um, foundation in seven different states where either deployed military or people with disabilities have voted in actual elections on their phones. Um, they have all succeeded. Turnout has increased materially. Um, and so we know the demand is there. We know that it works. Um, but we also knew that a lot of people in the cybersecurity community were concerned about safety. And what I realized is that uh, one of the biggest components to make it safe is that the technology be open source so it can be audited uh, and verified at all times. And the problem is the private companies in the space that were building tech, of course, weren't going to make their code open source because then they would lose all of their proprietary technology and advantage. And so the next thing that we did in my foundation was we've started building our own mobile voting technology um, that will allow people to securely vote on their phones and it will all be free and open source. So it is technology that is end-to-end encrypted, end-to-end verifiable. It is air-gapped. It has multi-factor authentication. It has biometric screening. It is open source. Um, It is significantly more secure, in my view, than any other form of voting. And to be clear, I'm not advocating to replace any form of voting we have. I'm just saying, let's come up with another option for people, meet them where they are, and then hopefully through that, we can get more people to participate in the process. How do we prevent hacking, for example? Yeah. Uh, so let's say, for example, you're using our the, our system, which is called Vote Hub. Sure. Um, you, you log on. Your jurisdiction first identifies that you are an eligible voter in that jurisdiction. Then they have their identification requirements. That's up to each jurisdiction, but it could be uh, biometric screening. It could be facial recognition. It could be digital signature. Uh, whatever it is, our, our technology accommodates it. Uh, then you know, you're looking at a ballot that kind of looks like almost anything online that you'd be voting for, you know, sports, American Idol, whatever it is, but you have your ballot, you cast your votes, the technology makes sure that you didn't undervote, you didn't overvote, that you completed it, you then verify exactly what it is, uh, the choices that you want to make, and once you're confident in that, uh, you hit send, and when you do that, the ballot is immediately encrypted, it is sent to the election office, then it is taken offline and decrypted, so that's the air gapping process by which um, a, a hacker can only access something if it's connected to the internet. If it's removed from the internet, they can't do so. So after the encrypted ballot reaches the election office, it's then decrypted after it's taken offline, and then a paper copy of the ballot is printed out, and each voter receives a tracking number by which they could see where their vote stands through each step of the process. So uh, when they're considering it, when they submit it, when it's been received, when it's been decrypted, when it's been printed and tabulated. Um, and so that's how we keep it secure. Um, and look, we've spent you know over $10 million building this technology. It's all my money out of my foundation. I've spent about $20 million of my own money total so far 
on mobile voting. Um, and I believe that, you know, unless that we can find a way to meet the voters where they are, we are never going to meaningfully increase turnout and we are never going to solve our problems. And whether it's guns or immigration or education or healthcare or housing or climate or anything else, it takes compromise. It takes consensus. It takes working together. And we live in a world right now where everything is so polarized and so fractionalized and so dysfunctional that nothing can get done. And we've got to change that. Which voting system, paper ballot or electronic, do you think, generally speaking, has the least chance of tallying error? Uh, I, you know, I actually think that it's electronic, and I'll tell you why. If, if you remember the, you look pretty young, so you, you were probably a kid, but the 2000 presidential election, Bush v. Gore, um, the entire election was determined by faulty paper ballots and the things called hanging chads in Florida, where they couldn't figure out who the vote had actually been cast for. Um, that ultimately resulted in George W. Bush being named president, despite Gore winning the popular vote. And after 9-11, it led to Bush choosing to invade Iraq, a decision that the 9-11 Commission itself later said had no basis in fact whatsoever. Um, as many as a million innocent people died in that war. We spent $1.7 trillion on that war to no benefit or outcome that has helped America ever since. And so I would say this, you know, mobile voting hasn't killed a million people or wasted $1.7 trillion. So if you ask me which system is more secure, I would say mobile voting by far. Do you think there's going to be resistance from Congress? Absolutely. So the good news is I don't need Congress. Uh, the bad news is I need state and city government all over okay. the place. So, um, but yes, you know, when you tell people who are in power, hey, I'm going to change up the rules, have more voters enter the process, and that might mean that you could lose power, um, that is going to be wildly threatening to them. And the reason or that gain I gain power, I mean, it doesn't but, have well, to be. But potentially, the people who have power now are just kind of like, hey, I like things the way they are. Sure. Uh, and people who are not on the system might say, okay, here's an opportunity to gain power. And ironically, once we do this, the job of being in office will become a much better job because you're no longer hostage to the extremes. Um, but it's going to require a movement. We are going to need millions of people, whether they're Gen Z or millennials or Gen Alpha uh, or different communities to demand to their elected officials, hey, I have the right. I should be able to vote securely on my phone. And I demand that you give me that right. Um, that's why I wrote this book. And I did that because it just is essential that um, – we are uh, able to start building a movement around it. And my hope is that people will read the book and we will release the technology and make it free to every single government that wants to use it. And then we can use that to start passing legislation, prove that it works and go from there. Well, this begs an interesting question is, to, do you expect new demographics of voters to open up because of this system? Absolutely. So uh, I dropped my daughter off at college as a freshman, my oldest kid, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And when we moved into her dorm room um we uh you know got a room key for her she got a bike room key and, and you know she didn't get a mail room key or a mailbox key because even though vote by mail is a wonderful reform and innovation that can work my 18 year old has no idea what that is but you know what since you and i just started this conversation she i can guarantee she checked her phone 43 times um and if you told her Go to a polling place, never going to happen. Vote by mail, never going to happen. But hey, press a few buttons on your phone, can definitely happen. You know, Chicago, for example, where they had the mayoral primary last year, vote out, voter turnout for voters under the age of 30 was 4%. Um, and fundamentally, the people whose lives are most impacted by the people who get elected to office are the people participating the least. And so I think that should we make mobile voting available, more young people are going to participate in the process, the same people who are watching you know, this feed right now, and that will give them more control over their future. Well, uh, ending on politics once more. So there's been some speculation that uh, government legisla legislation uh, may put guardrails on AI. So take a look at this. Venture capitalist Mark Anderson and Ben Horwitz point to concerns that Biden would overregulate AI. Uh, they cited Biden's 2023 executive order on AI in particular, which calls for government oversight uh, over AI development. Um, do you do you think attitudes will change or yeah i mean look mark and and ben harowitz are, are great venture capitalists but they i don't think they have any idea what they're talking about when it comes to government and regulation and politics okay. uh, the biden ai was completely toothless an executive order only has meaning if there are penalties in there for violating the executive order and it had absolutely none uh and Dreesen also opposed uh recent legislation in california that would require safety testing for ai the legislation passed overwhelmingly uh and i hope that gavin newsom governor of california will sign the bill um 
you, you can't look. I, anyone who's a VC is an optimist about tech, um, but living in a theoretical utopia where there's no rules, no regulations, no structure doesn't actually work. You can't build multi-billion-dollar industries and multi-billion-dollar companies in the absence of all rules and all regulation and all structure. And sort of this vision that I think a lot of my colleagues on Sand Hill Road have, you know, may make sense at a cocktail party or in a white paper somewhere, uh, but when it comes to the reality of human behavior. It's not realistic at all. Okay. Any risks to uh, to the workforce for humanity at large from the advent of AI? Absolutely. Look, we don't know what it is. So I am a big advocate for AI. I'm very bullish on it. But we don't know what the risks are going to be, which is why you need safety testing, why you need regulation. Um, it's kind of like if it's like saying, you know, should we just stop in, you know, inspecting and having rules for constructing cars or planes? No one's going to get in a plane or a car that was built with the absence of any rules, any regulations, any inspections, any anything. AI, if anything, is significantly more dangerous than a car or a plane. So the idea that we should build this thing with no oversight whatsoever is absolutely crazy. Here, here, here's a here's an out there question. If yeah. AI gains consciousness, which some people in the community say that singularity is only a matter of time. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for voting? Could they vote? Should they vote? They should not vote. Uh, AI are not people. Um, and the democratic process should certainly not be run uh, by bots of any kind. Um, so, no. But look, I think singularity, there are people who take that risk very seriously. There are people who sort of say it's overstated. I'm not sure. I'm not a technologist. But I think at the very least, you know, what I do know about is, is, is regulation. And we need a regulatory framework that at least can conceive of the potential harms from singularity from AI and not stop AI from being invented because there's a lot of gr good things that can come from it, but at the same time, anticipate the harms and be in a position to prevent them. Excellent. I appreciate your thoughts. Tell us where we can find your work. Well, first of all, your book comes out next week, right? Where, we can, where, yep. where, where can we find you? You can book? find the book anywhere, Amazon, any bookstore. Um, I, if you happen to be in New York City, I own a bookstore called P&T Knitwear on the Lower East Side. Come by and check us out. But but Amazon works just fine. Um, and then uh, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. Or if you go to BradleyTouch.com, you can find me there. Or if you're interested in what I have to say on mobile voting specifically, if you go to VoteWithYourPhone.org, there's a lot more information on there. You, you own a venture fund. You were previously involved in politics. You also own a bookstore. What what do you not do? <laughs> what, do uh, <laughs> what I have wanted to do and failed so far is I, I wrote a novel last year. And I've been trying really hard to turn it into a scripted TV show. Uh, okay. and I've had lots of meetings with lots of people in Hollywood who I'll tell you how great it is. Uh, and I have made no progress at all. So that, that is that's where I, one day I'd love to get to. Uh, but by the way, just ending on this note, uh, we haven't talked about uh, cryptos. We can talk more about that uh, next time. Sure. I have you yeah, and we'd love to come on anytime you want. Yeah, crypto projects. Um, any interest from VCs now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, it, it is a very real product and a very real market. And I think one piece of good news is, regardless of who wins this election, uh, Gary Gensler, who's the current SEC chair and the regulator of crypto, will be gone. He has been an absolute disaster for the sector. And so whoever we get next will be much more in favor of crypto innovation. And that's good news. Well, but just from a VC perspective, like let's take you, for example, are you seeing yeah. new projects develop with actual use cases that will, again, generate revenue? Are you like, is that happening in the space? I mean, there's crypto and there's blockchain, right? So okay. in terms of projects with different applications that tends to be more blockchain in terms of like okay we can you know do supply chain or tracking or things like that um, crypto is you know specifically believing in a particular currency uh, and that a lot of people are going to want to use it so there are products around it like should there be lending and, and things like that um, but ultimately all of that, those innovations require some level of rules and guidance from the SEC and the SEC has been an absolute disaster in terms of providing that so my hope is that once we get rid of this very bad leadership at the SEC and put better people in, then we're in a position to finally start seeing real innovation crypto again. I'm, I'm actually uh, a little bit surprised you didn't bring up blockchain as one of the ways that we could potentially verify identities. You know, we, we, we looked at it very, very closely. We ended up not building on the blockchain, Okay, um, but, but have used sort of a lot of the similar protocols. Okay. Well, we'll put the link to uh, your work uh, and your social media 
handles in the description below. So awesome. make sure to check out Bradley in the description down below and stay tuned for his book that's coming out soon. Uh, it's, it'll be on Amazon and all the other places. So uh, thank you very much, Bradley. Good to be uh, Hey, David, thank you, you for show. having me. This was really, I, I love when the interviewers are smart as thoughtful as you are. And so it was really a lot of fun. Thank I, you. I appreciate it. Thank you. We'll have you on again soon. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.